Good evening folks, it's Kent Hovind here and the crew at Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. And we have been wanting for a long time to redo our Creation Seminar series. Uh, we have put out for 30 years videotapes on the science and the creation and the Bible and dinosaurs and a variety of topics. I believe there are probably 15 million copies circulating around, uh, plus people have been allowed to make copies of them. One guy in Texas has 41,000 copies he's made and given out, so we haven't counted all those. But what I'd like to do is to begin tonight redoing some of the, because I've added so much material to that original Creation Seminar series, and freshen it up, update it, and everything else. So we want this to reach the whole world for, for the gospel, for Jesus Christ. So let's pray before we begin. Heavenly Father, we love you. We thank you for letting us be part of your family. Lord, I pray that you'll guide us as we share this information that will hopefully strengthen somebody's faith or draw them into your family if they're not saved. Please guide us now, Father, in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Okay, we're going to talk about what on earth is about to happen, for heaven's sake, a book that I wrote on that topic about the, what the Bible teaches about the future, but that's going to be a while till we get there. A seminar about the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment of God. This chart here is, we'll be referring to quite a bit. There's actually two charts. The bottom one is the big picture, 6,000-year history of the world, and then some of the details are shared in the big one. So here it is, the chart over here. You can order this on our channel, drdino.com, on our website. The bottom says Adam, here's Abraham, the flood and the life of Abraham, Moses, David, Daniel, Jesus on the cross. Here's the times of the Gentiles and the future coming day of the Lord. This little yellow stripe is greatly expanded to be this information here about that 70th week of Daniel. And this purple stripe is greatly expanded here with the thousand year reign of Christ. They'll be talking about this later. Tonight we're going to start off about this creation over here. You can get these charts, the big ones or small ones. Small ones are 10 bucks on our website, drdino.com. So if you want to follow along in this seminar, which may take about 400 years to, to videotape, we will uh, be glad to get, send you one of those. You can get that. Uh, this chart comes in two sizes. Okay, we're going to talk about the creation. First, I want to share the big picture. I'm going to try to summarize the big picture, what's going on with the bottom line of that chart. And then if you want to listen to the whole thing, this may go for many hours. We're going to cover all the details and chase every rabbit and kick every dog as we walk by. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. My name is Kent Hovind. I'm the third child. My dad was an engineer, uh, electrical engineer at Caterpillar Tractor Company. I was born and raised in East Peoria, Illinois. My dad was, uh, came home from World War II in the Marines, the only survivor of his platoon, uh, fighting the Japanese in the Japanese theater. My mom was a kindergarten teacher, public school, uh, for, retired from that job. My dad retired from Caterpillar. I was raised there in East Peoria and then uh, married and moved off to Michigan to finish college and traveled to a couple of different spots, lived in California for a couple of years and Pensacola, Florida for nearly 30 years. And then someone gave us this property here in Lenox, Alabama, straight north of Pensacola. And it is a blast around here. How many enjoy living in Lenox at Dinosaur Adventureland? Yeah, we got the crew here tonight. So the big picture is pretty simple. The Bible clearly teaches that God made the whole world in six days about 6,000 years ago. So this chart starts off with 4,000 BC. That's an approximation plus or minus, you know, 20, 30, 50 years maybe, I don't know. Then there was a big flood in the days of Noah right here about 4,400 years ago. That's what the Bible dates add up to and we'll get into more of that later. Shortly after the flood, God called a guy named Abram, changed his name later to Abraham, and he said, Abram, I've got, I got a job for you and your descendants, your children. I want you to bring the world the Messiah. And Jesus came through the line of Abraham. I want you to bring the world my law, my word. And so nearly all of the Bible is written by a Jew or a descendant of Abraham, just a few little minor exceptions. And he said, I want you to begin a nation, the nation of Israel, that's going to be the model nation, how it ought to be done or in their case, most of the time, how it ought not to be done. And so, if, you, if you're good, I'm going to bless you. If you're bad, I'm going to curse you. So he gave his laws to these children of Abraham, which today are called the Jews or the Hebrews. Shortly after that, they went down into slavery, down into Egypt for 400 years, and Moses led them out. So the next main character you get to is Moses. Moses brought them out into the Promised Land. They uh, had judges for quite a while, and then they said, we want a king. And so they had kings for about 400 years. And one of the famous ones is King David. He was about a thousand years before Christ. To kind of get the big picture on your mind. And then we have a guy, they went into captivity in Babylon. And God called a young man named Daniel to and showed him some things about the future. 
We'll get into more of Daniel's amazing prophecies later. He was about 550 or 600 BC before Christ. Jesus is right here. Of course, we, our calendar starts there, the year zero. This is called the times of the Gentiles. This is the time when God has probably taken the Jews and said, look, you guys are hard-headed. I'm going to put you over here. I'm going to graft in the wild olive branch, Romans chapter 11, and the times of the Gentiles. And we're not doing that hot of a job either of getting the gospel out. So he's going to take us out and put the Jews back in for a short time. So this is the big 7,000 year picture of history. We're going to talk about this creation. When was it? How old is this earth? What was it like? What, were there dinosaurs there in it, with Adam and Eve in the garden? Yes, there were. What happened to them? Where's the record? Why did they live to be 900? Then we'll talk about this flood in part two. Where did all that water come from? What did it do? Where did it go? Where's the water from Noah's flood? Where's the evidence of this flood? Part three, we'll talk about what the Bible teaches about the future. God tells us what's coming. He wants us to know what's coming. So we're going to start. The big picture is that there's been a war going on with God versus Satan for the whole time. And Satan wants to become God. He wants his job. So his job, he has been deceiving people ever since he tricked Eve in the garden. He started off with Eve. God had three words. God hath said. Satan changed the order. Hath God said. And she fell for it and began questioning God's word. And so there's been a battle going on. We'll talk a lot about that here in this series. But the big picture is most of what we see is, is human history is actually a war between Satan and God. And we are on the battlefield. Most of the time, the people in, in the battlefield just get caught up as casualties. And, you know, the people who live in the war zone suffer the most when the war goes through their neighborhood. So then we're talking about Satan's lies to keep people from believing God. There are over 75 lies in the typical textbooks, biology, earth science, and physical science textbook. Lies designed to make the kids believe this crazy evolution theory, which is, it's not even a theory, it's a religion, it's a belief system. Why is evolution theory dangerous? We'll talk about, this is the theory, the philosophy of evolution that says, oh, one species is better than another. So it's really best if these inferiors die off to help this new one get better and you know, take over the population. That was the motivation behind Adolf Hitler, Joseph Stalin, Paul Pot in Cambodia. We'll talk about that when we get to why evolution theory is dangerous. And then what should we be doing now in light of this information God owns the world, but there's a war going on. What should we be doing as his children? Or if you're not one of his children, how do you become one? Then we'll take miscellaneous questions and answers. There'll be a thousand questions that are brought up. How did the light from the stars get here? And uh, all this kind of stuff. We'll get carbon dating, potassium argon. We'll get into all that. So we're going to talk about God's original creation. I'll tell you a little bit about myself. Not if you don't care, fast forward. But I was, uh, we were born and raised in East Peoria, Illinois. We were, I was baptized as a Lutheran as a baby. Shortly after that, we became Mennonite, and I was only seven years old. I didn't know much about it. After Mennonite, at about age 12, my parents decided to switch to the uh, Methodist Church in Morton, Illinois, because uh, the Mennonites were kind of hard on my dad, because he'd been in World War II, you know, and they, they're pacifist. And so we were Methodist, and I was baptized again in the Methodist Church. And then at age 16, someone said, Kent, are you going to heaven? I said, I have no idea. I've been baptized twice, catechized, circumcised, homogenized, pasteurized, you know, what else you got to do? And so <laughs> they explained to me that I needed to accept Christ as my Savior. So at age 16, I gave my heart to the Lord, became a child of God, and started riding the bus to a little independent, temperamental, fundamental, right-wing, radical, chicken-eating Baptist church. And the preacher actually banged on the pulpit. I had never seen that before. In the church I was raised in, in the Methodist church, they actually had two pulpits. They had one over here where they read the Bible from, and then one over here where they talked from. Took me a long time to figure out why, but I figured out it's because what he's reading over here is so far from what he's saying over here, they got to separate it into two pulpits. And so, but I fell in love with that little Baptist church and started going there. Ended up going off to Bible college and getting my degrees there and ended up teaching high school science and math for 15 years. So I've been a Christian 50 years now. I got faith, say, February 9th, 1969. I believe the Bible is the inspired, infallible Word of God. That is where God preserved His words. The Bible says one of our jobs as Christians is to be ready always to give an answer to every man, a reason of the hope that's in us. And I think in the last 200 years, the Christians have not done a good job on this. And we've allowed this crazy evolution theory to take over our school system and our government and our whole thinking process. 
is now governed by this crazy idea that there's no God and we got here by chance. And I think we haven't done a good job of answering and it's time we get some answers. And that's what I'm going to try to provide to strengthen your faith. I have three goals actually in my seminar. Number one, I want to strengthen your faith in God's Word. Number two, if you're not saved, I'm going to try to get you converted. I would think you ought to become a Christian. Give your heart to the Lord Jesus Christ. Or at least make you rethink about it. Uh, number three, if you're saved and you're not doing much for the Lord, then I'm going to try to make you uncomfortable. Everybody ought to find something to do for the Lord. The worst of you could serve as bad examples, if nothing else. Say, so what do you do for the Lord? I'm a professional bad example. How not to do it? Okay. We don't need any more of those. Okay. The position is filled. All right. Now, the Bible says in 2 Peter chapter 3, Knowing this first, there shall come in the last days scoffers walking after their own lusts. There are people who scoff at the Bible, and it's not because of their science. It's because of their lust. When I spoke at Berkeley University, afterward, they, nobody would debate me there. I've done 161 debates now, but nobody would debate me at Berkeley. But afterwards, this big old football player came out to the table where we had our videotapes for sale, and he was just fuming. He said, evolution is a fact. I said, calm down, son. You're going to blow a gasket. I said, let me ask you a question. Suppose what I said tonight was true. Suppose the creation story is true. God made the world and God owns it. If you chose to believe that, would that change your lifestyle any? He was real quiet for a minute. He said, that would change everything. I said, well, son, now let me ask you a question. Do you believe in evolution because you really have some scientific evidence? Or because you like the freedom it gives you from God? He was real quiet for almost a minute. He said, I believe in evolution because I'm horny. I said, son, every male of every species, from termites to whales, understands that, but that's not a reason to reject God. Okay? They, they reject God because of their lust. That's the problem. It's not science. This is not science versus religion. Evolution is a religion. You have to believe in it. But the scoffers are going to say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things continue as they were from the beginning of the creation. It's a very important phrase where we get today the idea of what's called uniformitarianism. Whew, big word. That means the way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. All of evolution is based on that philosophy. And the Bible warned us 2,000 years ago, people were going to come and say this. Oh yeah, the way things are happening now is the way they've always been happening. And it's not true. One giant catastrophe like Noah's flood completely rearranged the real estate. We'll get into more of that later. The Bible says, for this they willingly are ignorant of. Willingly ignorant. That means dumb on purpose. They're willingly ignorant of three things. Number one, that by the word of God the heavens were of old. Notice a couple of things. Heaven is plural in this verse. In Genesis 1.1, heaven is singular. We'll get into more of that later. But they're willingly ignorant that God made the heavens by his word. He just spoke everything into existence. Just by his word. He didn't pound one nail, turn one screw. He didn't weld one joint. He simply spoke and everything lined up. The heavens were of old and the earth standing out of the water and in the water. Now read that carefully. How can the earth be out of the water and in the water? This is a critical phrase. We'll get into more of that later when we talk about the original creation. What was it like? Why did they live to be 900? So the first thing they're ignorant of is the creation. What was it like? The second thing they're ignorant of is the flood whereby the world that then was, that would be the world before the flood, being overflowed with water, perished. That world was completely wiped out. The world before Noah was wiped out, except for Noah and his family and the animals on the ark. So these scoffers are ignorant of the creation. They're ignorant of this flood. What would a global flood do to the world? See, people don't stop and realize this, but we are in Lenox, Alabama, 31 degrees north latitude. We're spinning around over 800 miles an hour around the Earth. If the moon was pulling the tides up during, like it is today, if there were no continents to interrupt things, like if, if the world was covered in water like it was during Noah's flood, the tides would become harmonic. They would go up 200 feet and back down, up 200 feet every 6 hours and 25 minutes. It would be every 6 hours, except the moon is also moving while we're turning. But the moon looks down and sees the bump. That's all it sees is the high tide. People on Earth see the water go up and down because we're turning under this, this bump. Which means 
if that water's coming up 200 feet, right now the tide starts coming up and then it bangs into something like South America or, you know, gets interrupted. If it was not interrupted, it would be harmonic, a 200-foot tidal change. If the water's coming up 200 feet here in Lenox, Alabama, where's all that water coming from? Sideways. The water would move sideways at the same rate the Earth is spinning. Can you imagine water here in Lenox, Alabama moving sideways at over 800 miles an hour to fill that bump? And then when the bump goes back down, the water rushes the other way at 800 miles an hour. What would that do? Water moving back and forth and up and down for Noah's in the ark for a year. I don't know how long Lenox was covered. Let's say a couple of months. That would make thousands and thousands of layers of strata, just like you see on these little things here. Water moving back and forth, up and down, would form thousands of layers of strata containing bazillions of dead things that are going to turn to fossils. But the scoffers are ignorant of the flood. It was overflowed with water. Thirdly, the heavens and the earth which are now, by the same word, that would be the word of God, are kept in store, reserved unto fire against the day of judgment and perdition of ungodly men. So Peter warned us 2,000 years ago the scoffers in the last days would be ignorant, willingly ignorant, of the creation, the flood, and the coming judgment of God. Those are three things we're going to focus on in this seminar series. And you can feel free to call me if you have any questions, 855-BIG-DINO, extension 3. I take phone calls all day long. Be glad to help. Or come visit us in Lenox. Romans chapter 1 says, Because when they knew God, they glorified Him not as God. Neither were thankful, but became vain in their imaginations, and their foolish heart was darkened. Professing themselves to be wise, they became fools. These folks who believe in evolution really, really think they're smart. <laughs> Boy, they do. And the Bible says they become a fool. Like this textbook says, Earth is thought to have formed 4.6 billion years ago. Very different from today's Earth. Then it says, Earth began as a hot ball of rock. Oh, really? Okay. Then it says, 3.9 billion years ago, that cooled down enough for water vapor to begin to condense. And it began to rain on these hot rocks for millions of years. And 3.5 billion years ago, the oceans filled in and created soup. And scientists believe the first living organisms appeared in this soup 3.9 billion years ago. You would have to be an absolute fool to believe such a thing. But this is what they believe. They professed themselves to be wise, and they became fools. But if a kid is taught that for 12 to 16 years in our school system, he's going to end up believing it. He'll get brainwashed. They hear this lie over and over and over. I spoke to 300 first graders one time. Try that sometime. Got a whole room full of first graders at a public school. I said, boys and girls, when did dinosaurs live? Instantly, all of them shouted out, millions of years ago. These kids can barely read. They're already brainwashed. See, it's very easy to get brainwashed. I'll show you. I'll try to brainwash the whole crowd. Brainwashing is a very simple thing to do. I'm going to tell you a story. When I'm done telling the story, I'll ask you two simple questions. If you know the answer, just raise your hand. Don't say it out loud. Ready? Here goes the story. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men, and why did he leave home jogging? If you know, just raise your hand. Don't say it out loud. Okay, several do. The rest of you, let's try it again. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. I'll give you a hint. That's important. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men, and why did he leave home jogging? Anybody new figure it out? Okay, let's try it one more time. Now I'm going to unbrainwash you. So you didn't realize it, but I brainwashed you in the first few seconds. I'll show you a picture that'll unbrainwash you. Once upon a time, a man left home jogging. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left. He jogged a little ways and turned left and jogged back home. As he was jogging home, he noticed two masked men were waiting for him at home. Who were the masked men? <laughs> Catch you in the empire. And why did he leave home jogging? Uh, he hit a home run. It is that easy to get brainwashed. As soon as I said a man left home, you started thinking about a house. 
and you were off track from then on. Here's how they brainwashed the kids in kindergarten. You ready for this? Boys and girls, I can read about dinosaurs. Anybody want to take a wild guess what the first sentence in the book says? Millions, Millions of years ago, <laughs> dinosaurs roamed the earth. That's calling Jesus a liar, by the way. We'll get into that in a minute. But all these books start off millions of years ago. The kids are being brainwashed to believing the earth is millions of years old or billions of years old and using God's own creatures to do it. We're going to try to put a stop to that, or at least put a dent in it <laughs> with this series. Millions of years ago, even Dr. Seuss, millions of years ago. Kids are facing this before they can read, and by the time they've taught, heard all this 10, 15, 20 years, they believe it. Now, Jesus said in Matthew 19, 4, He answered and said, Have you not read that he which made them at the beginning made them male and female? Jesus is claiming the creation of Adam and Eve was the beginning. So saying dinosaurs lived millions of years before man got here is calling Jesus a liar. Mark 10, 6, from the beginning of the creation, God made them male and female. That's what it says. They did not like to retain God in their knowledge, and God gave them over to a reprobate mind. For 2 Timothy says the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, which is good teaching, but after their own lust, they heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. They love to hear the idea, the earth is millions of years old and there is no God and there is no final judgment. They love to hear that. Oh, tell me more, tell me more. We were warned that's going to happen and they're here, folks. And they will turn away their ears from the truth and be turned unto fables like evolution, which is a fairy tale for grown-ups, a fable. But watch thou, Paul said to Timothy, Watch thou in all things, endure afflictions, do the work of an evangelist, make full proof of thy ministry. So what was that original creation like? We're going to talk about the Big Bang. It's a big dud. The earth cannot possibly be billions of years old. What was the Garden of Eden like? Why did they live to be 900? Were there dinosaurs in the garden? Oh yeah, we'll get into that in a minute. So we live in Lenox, Alabama, straight north of Pensacola, 70 miles, where we have dinosaur adventure land. Middle of no place. 70 miles dead north of Pensacola, get off at exit 77 on I-65 or exit 83, come to Lenox, and then ask, where's Dinosaur Adventureland? Well, just go straight north one mile. See the old gravel pit on Pearl Lane, about 140 acres, and we're having a blast. Building, Christian camp, science center, museum, theme park, combination of a lot of things. Don't tell anybody, but there really isn't a plan. We just want to use the science to <laughs> glorify God and bring people closer to Him. Come take a tour of the place. You won't believe it. In the old Dinosaur Adventure Land in Pensacola, we had 100,000 visitors from 120 foreign countries in all 50 states. We had nearly 1,000 people get saved. We've already had 35 baptized in our lake here. We're going to win souls. That's, and one in the spa because it was too cold to baptize in the lake. Okay. You'll be the second. We do a lot of work around here because we want to change people's worldview. A Russian atheist astronomer came to America one time, Pensacola actually, he said, folks, either there is a God or there isn't. I thought, wow, this guy's really smart. smart. <laughs> and then he said, both possibilities are frightening. Whoa, that is pretty cool. See, if there's a God, we better try to find out who he is and figure out what he wants and do what he says because he owns this place and he makes the rules. If there is no God, we're in trouble. We're going around the sun at 66,000 miles an hour and nobody's driving. <laughs> Now, there are, there are four great questions that every single religion in the world tries to answer. And evolution is a religion. And they try to answer these questions too. Here's the four fundamental questions of life that every single religion answers or tries to. Who am I? And what am I worth? Where did I come from? Why am I here? And where am I going when I die? This is the Simple, four fundamental questions that every religion tries to answer. Now, evolution says, you know, it's amazing, amazing, a Big Bang made all this from nothing. That's the humanist worldview that says man is God and answers to no one. Christians say, no, there's incredible design. There must be a designer, and that's the creationist worldview. God is God, not you. And these two worldviews are at war with each other. There is a war going on. And we are right smack in the middle of it here, and we're having a good time. Okay. Uh, Sir Arthur Keith, famous evolutionist, said, The law of Christ is incompatible with the law of evolution. The two laws are at war with each other. I agree. And Arthur, you chose the wrong side. 
Four great questions. Who am I and what am I worth? Well, the Bible says, in the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth. That would mean God owns it. And by the way, you want a King James Bible if you're going to follow along here. Heaven is singular. All the other versions, heaven is plural. You can't even go seven words in these other Bible versions before you come to a difference. Well, somebody's wrong. We cover that later. Why? This is right and they're wrong. But <clears throat> the, the devil doesn't like that. The devil came to Eve in the Garden of Eden. The serpent came to the woman. He said, Yea, hath God said, Ye shall not eat of every tree of the garden? First sentence out of the devil's mouth was a question to make Eve doubt God's word. And that's what all the Bible versions is about, too. It raises confusion. Well, which one's right? Man, well, I better look it up in this one and that one and the other one. We'll get into why. You better stick with the King James later. But Satan has started off his career. These are the first words out of his mouth recorded for us in the Bible. Started off his career changing God's words. Instead of God hath said, it's hath God said. And starting off trying to make people doubt what God had said and lead people away from God. That's what he does. He wants you to doubt the word. The second thing he said to the woman, he said, ye shall not surely die. Well, now he's calling God a liar, denying God's word. The third thing he said is what I want to talk to you about for a minute right now. He said, God doth know that in the day ye eat thereof, your eyes shall be opened and ye shall be as gods. Whoa, deify mankind. Eve, if you eat off that tree, you get to become God. And that's what evolution's all about. Yes, boys and girls, we started off like an amoeba, and we're evolving. We're getting bigger and better and stronger and smarter. Someday we're going to sail around the universe and discover new life forms like Star Trek. People ask me all the time, they say, Hovind, do you think there's intelligent life on other planets? I say, no. I taught high school 15 years. There's not much intelligent life on this planet. <laughs> but this whole idea that man is improving and we're going to become a superhero someday. and We get to wear our underwear on the outside of our pants. Okay. The superheroes, okay? This is, and kids are fascinated by this kind of stuff, and you better be careful because it really ties in with evolution theory that we are evolving, getting better. See, Lucifer is the one who wants to be God. In Isaiah 14, uh, the prophet said, How art thou fallen from heaven, O Lucifer, which is the devil, son of the morning? How art thou cut down to the ground, which didst weaken the nations? For thou hast said in thine heart, now there's an interesting phrase, do you know God knows what you're thinking in your heart? Wow. And he's got a record of all of it. Everything you've ever thought about, everything you've ever said, everything you've ever done. He's got it all written down. And that'll be read back to your judgment day. Unless the blood of Jesus Christ has been applied and your record's clean. They're going to open up my books and say, this one's empty. Whew, praise God for that. <laughs> Amen. I don't want all my... How many, of you do, how many of you do not want your stuff all read back for everybody to hear? Okay. <laughs> praise God. Thou hast said in thine heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit upon the mount of the congregation in the sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the Most High. See, the devil wants to be God, but the job's not available. But this started in the Garden of Eden, a long war against God. Henry Morris did a fabulous book on that topic called The Long War Against God, what's been going on. And this current evolution theory is nothing but one more chapter in that book of Satan who hates God. He told, he told Eve she could become God. Many religions teach you get to become God if you follow us. The Mormons teach that. Official Mormon doctrine. We can become gods like our Heavenly Father. That's what the Mormons teach. There are great books to reach Mormons if you want to get in study into that interesting study. I was surprised. The Catholic Catechism, which is uh, here on the shelf someplace. The Catholic Catechism teaches, the Son of God became man so that we might become God. Now, there isn't one Catholic in 10,000 that knows their church believes that, but that is the official doctrine of the church. Check it out. There's the references right there. Some guy named Benjamin Cream said he was a, got 140 messages from Miatra, the world teacher. My dear friends, I'm happy to be with you once more. My plan is my teaching should precede my presence and prepare my way. When mankind is somewhat prepared, my voice shall be heard. He said, firstly, men must see themselves as brothers, sons of the one Father. This is essential if they would progress one step nearer the Godhood, Godhead. My plan is to show you that the way out of your problem is to listen again to the voice of the true God within your hearts. Oh, so God's inside of you. You get to become God. Therefore, I am come quickly among you once more. May this light 
love and power lead you to seek that which dwells in silence within you, find that you find that and know that you are gods. This is the new age movement right there. You get to become God. It's amazing how many churches and religious groups teach this idea that you get to become God. I was surprised to find out that Kenneth Copeland teaches that. God's reason for creating Adam was his desire to reproduce himself. I mean a reproduction of himself. And in the Garden of Eden, he did just that. He was not a little like God. He was not almost like God. He was not subordinate to God even. Adam was as much like God as you can get. Adam in the Garden of Eden was God manifest in the flesh. Kenneth, you are absolutely certifiably insane if you believe such a thing. You're not going to become God. Kenneth Copeland said, you don't have a God in you, you are one. Mm. Oh yeah, let's see you walk on water. Mm. Watch that one, okay? I, I, I'm a lifeguard, I'll save you, okay? Um, wow. Kenneth Hagin said, the believer is as much an incarnation as was Jesus of Nazareth. The believer is called Christ. That's who we are. We're Christ. You're crazy. You're not Christ, but this is what evolution is all about. It's another one of the religions that teaches man becomes God. Boys and girls, we started off like an amoeba, and we slowly evolved. Here's all the animals, which would be the people, and we're related to the bacteria. This is what kids face every day in school. All the plants, everything is related, all brothers and sisters, to a common ancestor, a single-celled animal. Evolution, change in a population of organisms over time. Here we started off like an a monkey and slowly became a human. We're getting bigger and better. This is the you can become God idea. There's grandpa right there. Well, great grandpa, okay? Now, this chart is in a typical public school textbook. Tell me, what is the image they're trying to get across here? Humans are evolved from single cell protozoa. Aren't, isn't that what this is? And everything came from the single cell protozoa. I do a lot of debates. I did one the other day, and they said, Hovind, you don't understand evolution. Of course, dogs always produce dogs, and cows always produce cows. I said, well, are dogs and pineapples related, if you go back far enough in time? Well, they'll have to say yes. Okay, was this original ancestor, this protozoa, that turned into a human and a plant and seaweed and a whale, was this a whale or a human? Did it turn into something other than its kind? See, they're lying to the kids now saying evolution says, of course, cows produce cows and whales produce whales. That's going forward, but going backwards, you do really believe that somewhere long ago and far away in La La Land, SpongeBob imagination stuff, this thing was able to produce something other than its kind. They, a lot of things, yeah, they get embarrassed by that. So in the evolution religion, and it's a religion, humans began as a single-celled creature and slowly evolved into everything we have today, that man is becoming God. That's the evolution theory. That's what's taught to the kids day after day after day. What do we do? Well, Lucifer is the one who wants God's job. Five times he said, I will, I will, I will, I will, I will be like the Most High. He wants to be God. Now, God said, let us make man in our image. We are made in God's image, but we're not God, and you're not going to become God. But Hitler said, if you tell a lie long enough and loud enough and often enough, the people will believe it. He said they're more likely to believe a big lie than a small one. If you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you need to do it like my two big brothers did to me. I had two older brothers. They were always older than I was. When I was about six years old, I came running in for breakfast one morning, East Peoria, Illinois. Now, I know I'm in Alabama now, and they're going to say, oh, you're a Yankee. Hey, I moved south. I understand. But you folks in Alabama, just remember who won, okay? Uh, but that was a long time ago, okay? Uh, <clears throat> my two big brothers came running in, I, I was, and I was the first one there for breakfast, and I got the last banana out of the bowl to put on my cereal. And my big brothers came in and said, hey, Kent, is that the last banana? I said, yep, and I got it. How many of you have an older brother or sister? You know that wonderful feeling you get when you finally pull one over on them? Boy, that morning I had them, and I knew it. They wanted my banana. But big brothers do not beg little brothers for anything. They either beat them up and take it away by brute force, or they lie to them and trick them out of it somehow. So my brother said, hey, Kent, do you know how bananas are made? I said, no. I was only six years old. It's been proven in laboratory tests. The brain doesn't even start to grow until kids are 18 to 20. 
How many parents can verify that one from raising kids? Yeah, okay. I said, no, how are bananas made? And they said, well, down in South America, they have these spiders that live up in the trees, and when they die, all their legs fold up, and then mold grows around the dead spider legs, and a banana is actually nothing but moldy spider legs. I said, you guys are lying. You just want my banana because you know it's the last, last one. They said, no, we're not lying, brother. Cut it in half. Look in the middle. You can still see the black spots where his legs were. I did not eat bananas for nearly three years after that. I gave him my banana that morning for breakfast and went without. I would not have believed that lie if it hadn't been for those black spots. If you want to get somebody to believe a lie, you've got to mix it in with some truth. That's what they do to kill rats. You don't give the rat a bowl of poison, he won't eat it. You give the rat a bowl of good food with a little tiny bit of poison mixed in there. 0.005% poison. Mix two things together that don't belong together. The rat thinks he's getting free food and he's getting poisoned. That's what they've done for years to sell Marlboro cigarettes. They mix them in with cowboys. Get any Marlboro commercial, you'll be a cowboy on there. Have you ever thought about that? What's the connection between smoking Marlboro and cowboys? <laughs> Do all cowboys smoke Marlboro? No. Do you have to smoke Marlboro to be a cowboy? No. If you start smoking Marlboro, do you become a cowboy automatically? No. no. You may smell like a horse, but you're not a cowboy. Actually, it's been proven in laboratory tests, nobody smokes. Only the cigarette smokes. The person is the sucker, that's all. But I think they ought to put the real name on those things and call them cancerettes, breath rotters, bypass, malignant, phlegm balls, and money suckers, yeah. But they do the same thing with beer. They try to associate beer with sports. They get some big football player holding a can of Bud Dumber, or Bud Stupid. They call it Bud Wiser. It don't make him any wiser, that's for sure. He's holding his Bud Dumber, Miller Low Life, or Dead Dog. He says, man, you drink this stuff and you'll be a football player. <laughs> right. You drink that stuff, you will wreck your life. The Bible says, who hath woe, who hath sorrow, who hath wounds without cause? How'd you get hurt? I don't know. <laughs> they that tarry long at the wine. Look not thou upon the wine when it's red. Don't even look at it when it moves and gets fermented. Don't even look at it, the Bible says. Woe to him that giveth his neighbor drink. The Bible's got a lot to say on the topic. Don't even, don't taste it. One kid said, what's the matter, Hovind? Don't you like beer? I said, I don't know. I've never tasted it. I'm 66 years old, never had a drop in my life. Well, I've had NyQuil a couple times. He said, well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? I said, now, son, that's a brilliant way to live your life. Let me ask you a question, kid. Have you ever laid your head under a semi-truck? Well, how do you know you won't like it if you don't try it? <laughs> you don't have to try everything to know if it's good or bad. There are other ways to learn, you know. But this mixing of the good and the bad together is what's happening in our science books. Just like the cowboys and the cigarettes and the beer and the football, they've mixed some poison in our science. I like science. We have a science center here in Lenox, Alabama. Come on up. We have all kinds of fun science activities to do. There's our science center building. We're in it right now. And the new building behind, we're going to move up there as soon as we can here, get it done. All kinds of fun stuff. Our bookstore, lots of books and videos on science and the Bible and all this kind of stuff. All kinds of activity just straight north of Pensacola, Florida, 70 miles. You can come see our dinosaur adventure land. Skins and skulls of all kinds of different animals. Come take the tour. Go up and down the sand dunes. And our old dinosaur adventure land had all kinds of stuff. We'll get it up here too. Uh, we lift yourself up in the long neck lift of sore. We had visitors from everywhere. School groups come. It'll happen here. It's coming as soon as we're ready for it. People come. We had hundreds of visitors. Uh, lots of amazing rocks and minerals. One of my guys actually shot a T-Rex. And so we hung the head on the side of the building. Uh, that's a joke, Anna. Okay. Uh, but there's our Parasaurolophus, and we have uh, all kinds of fun stuff. Our Super uh, Circle Swivel Spring Swingosaurus, the kids love that one, our three-dimensional maze, and our giant leap of faith swing. We have, what we're trying to do with science is just simply glorify God. <clears throat> Say, boy, God made everything. You can measure your horsepower. How many horsepower are you? Come find out. We've got the machine out there. Measure your horsepower. All kinds of fun stuff at Dinosaur Adventure Land. We'll get it all up here. Our fossil dig pit. We like science. People say, you, guys, you Christians are against science. No, we love science. But evolution isn't part of science. We, all, we still have all kinds of homeschool classes on science uh, available in the bookstore. Uh, or Homeschool science classes, the uh, college classes, all kinds of fun stuff. We teach really cool stuff about pendulums and gravity and magnetism and light and all that. We teach kids the scientific way to shoot a rubber band. Come on down to Dinosaur Adventureland. 
that family was here today. I let them shoot the rubber band, and then mine went like three times further. And they, how did you do that? Oh, it's top secret. Come on down to Dinosaur Adventureland. We'll teach you how to shoot a rubber band the scientific way. We make a paper airplane. We make a round airplane. How many have seen our round airplane fly? Pretty cool. On the airfoil principle, the air, moving air has low pressure. Airplane wings are curved on top, straight on the bottom. Air going over that curve creates lift, which is why they don't race Volkswagens, by the way. At about 120, they will lift off the ground. You don't want that to happen. So if one of your buddies says, hey, I just put a jet engine in my VW, you want to go for a ride? Don't go for a ride. Wait about two weeks and go visit him in the hospital if he wakes up, okay? We teach kids how to make our super airplane that goes 400 feet. Come on down to Dinosaur Adventureland. We're not against science, but we're against mixing poison in the science books, that's for sure. And there's some poison. Here's a first grade book. First grade. They tell the kids, Earth has changed much since its formation four and a half billion years ago. Hold on. Is the Earth four and a half billion years old? No, but if you tell that to a first grader, he's going to believe you. First graders believe everything you tell them. They believe bananas are moldy spider legs. Then you tell them again in second grade. Since its formation four and a half billion years ago, Earth has changed. At the bottom it says, life too has evolved on Earth. This word evolved is a very tricky word. I've done 161 debates now with evolutionists at different universities. I have one coming up this uh, Saturday in Wisconsin. I'll be up there for one, and I'll be glad to do some more. And if you, have, if you go to a public university or school, high school, I'll be glad to come debate all the professors at the same time, as long as I get half the time and we discuss one topic at a time. Real simple. They gave, the guys may be a lot smarter than me, but I promise you they'll have their hands full trying to defend this dumb evolution religion. And it's a religion because I've carefully defined the word. That word has six different meanings. Then we'll quit and take a break for the next session. Evolution has six different meanings. First of all, there'd have to be cosmic evolution, the origin of time, space, and matter. You can Google, where did God come from by Kent Hovind and see my two minute answer to that question. Where did God come from? Which has gone viral on the internet with 60 million views. Time, space, and matter, each one of those is a trinity, and each one of these has to come into existence at the same time, in a certain order. If you had matter, but no space, where would you put it? If you had matter and space, but no time, when would you put it? God answers all this in ten words. In the beginning, there's time. God created the heaven, there's space, and the earth. He made time, space, matter in that order. And time is a trinity. There's three parts, past, present, future. You can't have one without the other two. As Soon as you have past, you instantly have present and future. Space is three dimensions, length, width, height. You can't have just one or two. That's why the flat earth idea is wrong. It has to be three dimensional, it has to be. Matter comes in three flavors, solid, liquid, gas. Plasma is just a hotter gas. But the Big Bang Theory is a big dud but that's the cosmic evolution, and you can Google it. That is a real phrase, and it's part of the evolution theory. This one is silly, not true, crazy, but that's part of it. Secondly, there have to be chemical evolution. Because if the Big Bang Theory were true, it would produce hydrogen, maybe helium, maybe a little bit of lithium, deuterium. How do you get all these other elements? You mean to tell me you can get gold, silver, and platinum from hydrogen gas? I'd like to learn how to do that. Yeah. They say, well, yeah, fusion in stars. Well, you can't fuse past iron. So how do you get gold, silver, and platinum out of hydrogen gas? I'd like to see how that's done, please. They don't talk about it much, but there would have to be chemical evolution, number two. Number three, there'd have to be stellar evolution. The stars would have to evolve. Nobody's ever seen a star form. You can go up on our sand dunes here at Dinosaur Adventureland and see a bazillion stars, but we've never seen one form. We don't know how a single one of these stars managed to form. Nobody understands or can demonstrate star formation. Not even good theoretical answers. The origin of stars represents one of the most fundamental unsolved problems of contemporary astrophysics. No one really understands star formation. It's remarkable. What they do see is stars blow up once in a while. It's called a nova or a supernova. That happens every 30 years or so. A star blows up. That's the opposite. Where's one forming? You can go out, they, they did a study with one of the big telescopes, I think it was the Hubble. They zoomed in on a spot the size of a grain of sand held at arm's length. They said, we don't think there's anything in that spot. 
as they zoomed in on that one little spot, as big as a grain of sand held at arm's length, they said, whoa, there's more stars in here than we can count. So they did an estimate of how many are in that spot and then calculated, okay, well, how much would that be over all of space? Just do the math. They said there's probably 70 sextillion stars, which means that's 11 trillion for every person on Earth. 11 trillion each. That means if the universe is 13.7 billion years old, there'd have to be 9.7 million new stars forming every minute for 13.7 billion years. Where's all this matter coming from? This is pure fairy tale stuff. Hitler said, if you tell a lie, tell a big one, people will believe it. Boy, you're crazy to believe in cosmic evolution or stellar evolution. Number four would have to be organic evolution, the origin of life. How did life get started? Nobody knows how a mixture of lifeless chemicals became a living cell. They can't even make it happen. One atheist I was debating, he said, Hoven, what are you going to say if scientists make life in the laboratory? I said, well, I'd like to point out, they're nowhere close to making life in the laboratory. Nowhere close. He said, well, yeah, you're right. I said, but if a bunch of scientists make life in the laboratory, I guess that would demonstrate that it takes intelligence to make life. Wouldn't it? It would prove my point, not yours. Primordial soup from Wikipedia. Primordial soup, a term introduced by the Soviet biologist Alexander Operin. In 1924, he said, we have chemical evolution of particles that contain carbon in the primordial soup. I access this today. Primordial soup. Prebiotic soup, the hypothetical set of conditions present on Earth 4.2 to 4 billion years ago. Fundamental aspect to the heterotetrophic theory of the origin of life. You have to have primordial soup come alive. Primordial soup. Earth had a reducing atmosphere. This is important because you can't have oxygen because it messes everything up. Even though the Earth had more oxygen at first. But they say, oh no, it had a reducing atmosphere. The atmosphere exposed to energy produced simple organic compounds. These compounds accumulated in the soup, which may have been concentrated at various loca locations like shorelines and ocean vents. By further transformation, more complex organic polymers, ultimately life, developed in the soup. So they do teach life came from soup. It was thought that appreciable amounts of molecular oxygen were present in the prebiotic atmosphere. Oxygen's a real problem for that. We'll get into that another time. So you can read all about prebiotic soup and Miller and urine experiments there if you'd like. But they have to have organic evolution. Somehow, somewhere, life has to get started. And they have got all kinds of stuff on the internet about how they think it might have happened with this, and the different problems with it. Spontaneous formation of the soup from the soup theory of polymers. It doesn't happen. This is made up stuff. I'll let you read these quotes on your own. You can hit pause if you'd like. Evolution encompasses a wide range of phenomena. Emergence of major lineages, mass extinction, evolution of antibiotic resistance. However, within the field of evolutionary biology, the origin of life is of special interest. I do a lot of debates and they'll say the origin of life is not part of evolution. Well, tell the folks at Berserkly they think it is. Yes, it's part of the evolution theory. Many lines of evidence illuminate the origin of life, how life originated. Oh, okay. They do not represent a change in the basis of evolutionary theory. Just because we've got different hypotheses doesn't mean we don't know it. We don't know how it happened, but we know it happened. That's what they're trying to not say there. Here you can learn about important hypotheses regarding when, where, and how life originated. You're not allowed to question, did it evolve? You're only allowed to find out how it evolved. Just as species are believed to have evolved over time, individual molecules that form the basis of life also likely developed in response to natural selection. Life on Earth began 3.7 billion years ago in the chemical soup. Yes, guys, evolution theory includes the origin of life. Mm, boy, they don't like me saying that. Too bad. Okay. Molecules swimming in Earth's early primordial soup would have been bombarded by ultraviolet radiation from the sun. Certain pairs of molecules combined to form a larger compound, and slowly, slowly, in the deep sea vents, hydrothermal vents, it all got together and came alive into the, in the soup. This is ridiculous. Bring it up in a debate sometime. We'll talk more about that. 
Number five, you'd have to have what's called macroevolution. Changing from one kind of animal into another. This has never been observed. With there are today 339 recognized breeds of dogs. They might have had a common ancestor, a dog. Today you have big dogs and little dogs. Like your dog beans right there, the chihuahua, right? There's limits though, and they're still dog. I'll get a fourth grader or a four-year-old sometimes. I'll get some four-year-old kid. Hey kid, here I have a dog, a wolf, a coyote, and a banana. Which one is not like the others? I've only had one kid ever miss it. One kid said, the boy. <laughs> well, he got a point. That was, not, that was not like the others too, but there's the banana. Okay. The Bible says they're going to bring forth after their kind. And Charlie Darwin's book changed it and said the origin of species. Oh, now Charlie, that's not what it's about. Chihuahua and Great Dane are the same kind of animal. It's a dog. Lastly is microevolution. Variations within the same kind. Ah, now this one happens. So someone says, do you believe in evolution? I say, well, that depends what you mean by that word. Do you mean cosmic, chemical, stellar, organic, macro? No, I don't believe any of those. That's pure fairy tale stuff. Do you believe there's variations within the kind? Sure, that happens. I don't think we should call it microevolution because it gives it what's called the free rider effect. We cover much more on that on video four of my series. Certainly variations happen. One mama cat with four different colored babies? Yeah. But teachers are told, be sure to stress to your students that the earth is billions of years old. Make sure they believe that when they get out of your class. Because that's essential for evolution theory. I think we ought to be teaching science. Real science, like the first and second laws of thermodynamics. We'll cover that tomorrow night. So, in general here, God claims he made the world. He made it in six days, and it, the dates in the Bible add up to about 6,000 years ago. That's what he claims. He claims he made a perfect world. And he claims he made the animals and plants so that they could bring forth after their kind. I think that means he put variety in the gene code so that they could produce long hair or short hair. And some dogs can survive in cold weather and some can survive in hot weather. And he made apples where they can be selectively bred and there's what a thousand varieties of apples now, but they're still an apple. God made the gene code incredibly complex with a lot of variety in it, but there's definite limits. Still the same kind. We have a war going on where God claims he did it all and evolution says, no, we don't need God at all. It just happened by chance. You've got to choose which one you're going to believe. Get on one side or the other. I think the evidence is overwhelming. God did indeed create this world. And he loves you. But if you've sinned and broken his laws, he's going to have to be a just judge and give you what you deserve. I don't want what I deserve. I want his mercy. And you can call out and ask for that. I did that 50 years ago. I said, Lord, I'm a sinner, but I believe you died on that cross for me. I believe you rose from the dead. I want to receive your payment on my account. And I gave my heart to him that day, February 9th, 1969. If you're not sure you're saved, why don't you do that right now? Say, Lord, would you please forgive me and save me? Please come live in my heart. Save me. And then call us. Ask us any questions you've got. 855-BIG-DINO, extension 3. Extension 1 if you want to order our materials. Or come visit Dinosaur Adventureland in Lenox, Alabama. We'd love to have you. See you next time. Bye.